Uh, we are honored uh, that Chantal Mouffe kindly accepted our invitation to come to speak to us tonight. Um, myself, it's, I mean, a new, unusual actually position for an artist to introduce political philosopher. I'm humbled by this and uh, also a kind about, happy about this because it means that we are really reaching the new level of cross-disciplinarity. It's perfectly known to most of us that uh, in the context of worldwide constellation of research, debate, and discussion concerning the present and the future of democracy, Chantal Mouffe has been most inspiring, critical, and provocative contribution and challenge. Her thoughts are widely known and well acknowledged. She has influenced and set the tone for the debates not only in the field of political philosophy and ethical philosophy, the closer fields to her work, but also in discourses in urban planning, urban geography, cultural geography, urban sociology, urban anthropology, urban policy making even, urban design and architectural design, especially one that concerns public space, of monuments, memorials, also in social psychology, especially among those who work on conflict and post-conflict transformation or justice and reconciliation projects. She influenced the media and multimedia performance, urban and interventionist artists, critical and interrogative designers, social movement activists, and many others, including, of course, all disinterested parties, the lovers of the city and the amateur viveur of the city. Chantal Mouffe is educated at the universities of uh, Louvain, Paris, and Essex, a professor of political theory at the University of Westminster. She has taught at a great number of universities in Europe, North America, Latin America, and has held research positions at Harvard, Cornell, University of California, Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique in Paris. Between 89 and 95, she was the director of uh, program uh, uh, at uh, the College, College International de Philosophie in Paris. Her publications include, uh, or she was an editor of Gramsci and Marxist Theory, Dimensions of Radical Democracy, Deconstruction and Pragmatism, The Challenge of Carl Schmitt, and co-author with Ernesto Laclau of Hegemony and Socialist Strategy Towards the Radical Democratic Politics in 1985. Very influential book. Um, I'm sure many of us read it. She's an author of uh, Return of the Political in 1993, The Democratic Paradox, the book that I always keep somewhere in my shelves in my pocket. And her latest work on the political, published by Rutledge in 2005 is probably also known here. In March 2011, she was awarded Medaglia al Merito de la Universidad Vercruzana in Mexico. Mexico. <laughs> As it's stated in her website, she is currently elaborating a non-rationalist approach to political theory formulating an agonistic model of democracy and engage in research projects on the rise of right-wing populism in Europe and the place of Europe in a multipolar world order. At GSD, Chantal Mouffe's influential work plays a vital part in our theoretical, artistic, and professional discourse and design and art making process. Discussions and readings of Chantal Mouffe's ideas reverberated through all our five busy floors of this building and beyond uh, in our departments, programs, and various research and educational projects at GSD and elsewhere at Harvard. The intellectual and emotional energy and excitement with which uh, this room, I feel, is charged today testifies 
to those facts. And it does so to the point that there seems to be no real need for Chantal Mouffe's formal introduction. <laughs> Indeed, it is not, it cannot be an introduction. This is our welcome. Agonistic democracy versus aggregative, deliberate one, agonistic pluralism versus the liberal one, the political versus politics, and other concepts invented, introduced, and advocated by Chantal Mouffe circulate in an inspiring and informative ways in our intellectual and artistic veins. They form both a vision and a critical project, the living dynamic horizon for democracy and democratic process, both horizon and a paradox. This is a vision and project for something to be created through agon, contest, passion, dissensus among adversaries or friendly enemies, she says. Something never to be given or taken for granted, nor secure, managed, or conceived as a final solution, or something fixed, achieved through liberal consensual compromise. Never a result of the so-called agreement achieved at the expense of the exclusion of most urgent, critical, and crucial voices, people's needs, demands, points of view, experiences, social issues, and political and human rights. Chantal says, for me, there is democracy as long as there is a conflict and uh, that existing arrangements can be contested. If we arrive at the point where we say there is the end point, contestation is no longer legitimate, this means the end of democracy. I think that what is important, she says, is to subvert the consensus that exists in so many areas and to reestablish the dynamics of conflictuality. This welcome, it, for me, is both public and a personal matter. This is an expanding cross-disciplinary place, as I mentioned, the fact that as an artist like myself, not a philosopher or political theorist, could be asked to introduce Chantal Mouffe is a proof of such ambitious and brave, as I admit, cross-disciplinary condition. All this, of course, condition was inspired by Chantal Mouffe's work itself, first place. As one among so many artists, designers, teachers, and as someone who on occasions writes on the subject of art and design in the public domain, I own a great deal to Chantal Mousse, its theoretical work, her vision, analytical, critical thoughts, and her precise, clear, and passionate public presence and performance. Knowing firsthand its value, I advocate it to my younger colleagues, artists, and designers, and students. Over three decade, decades, Chantal Mousse's writing have been at the top of the required readings list in both studio and seminar courses I teach. Some of us here sitting in this lecture know very well what I mean. As for them, so it's for me her work has helped in all my attempts to better understand my own work towards its critical reevaluation and more conscious and more powerful continuation. As an artist and someone who coordinates a program called Art Design a Public Domain, I'm glad to hear that Chantal Mouffe rejects the claim that art has lost its critical power because any form of critique is automatically recuperated and neutralized by capitalism. What is needed, she says, is widening the field of artistic intervention by intervening directly in Ex multiplicity of social spaces in order to oppose the program of total social mobilization of capitalism. According to the agonistic approach, critical art is, is that that helps the census, that makes visible what the dominant consensus tends to obscure and obliterate. Reading Chantal's passionate essays and interviews and books inspires us to pose crucial to ask questions and simultaneously with her articulate and explore 
in trying to find original forms and functions for agon uh, and, and, and do, it, do it through our artistic design practice and theoretical research. I have some of those questions that I am trying to explore through my own work and also I try to share them and, uh, with my colleagues. Some of them are, how can we best contribute to the creation of symbolic shared common space for agonism? In other, how can we as designers and artists be of use in contributing to creation of zones and practices for democratic conflict? Another question, keeping such horizon in mind, in what specific ways can we contribute, in Chantal Mouffe's words, to creation, inspiration, and operation of discourses through, under, uh, through understood in a very wide sense institutions and forms of diversified particip participations, participations. The issue, interesting work probably we can explore here. What is our role as designers and artists towards conditions for des desirable good conflict? The one between adversaries, not enemies, or conflict between friendly enemies. Joining call of Chantal Mouffe for inclusiveness of the agonistic pluralism, how can we as designers and artists, again using her words, con contribute to hearing most of the voices that have been silenced or that have not been able to express themselves? Maybe a voice that has not yet emerged because the whole culture of consensus simply does not allow for people to envisage that things could be different than you see. Now, connecting political theory with social psychology, I must add another issue. How can we as designers and artists contribute to conflict transformation rather than to management of conflict or conflict resolution? The transformation of malignant, potentially bloody conflict into creative one. Uh, speaking as uh, ourselves, uh, future authors of memorials and other commemorative artistic projects and sites of memory, how can we contribute to agonistic memory? Discursive pluralistic one, the agon of testes, a memory work rather than to symbolic reinforcements of unison of memory. Speaking of peace, this is the last question issue that Chantal Mouffe's work inspires in my, my, for my work and thinking, how can we contribute to the positive peace? Agonistic peace, as Chantal Mouffe probably preferred to call it. Proactive, discursive, conflictual, radically pluralistic peace, rather than negative peace, passive, melancholic, post-traumatic, peaceful, pacified peace. As Brecht said in his poems about the city, the cities are allowed to change, but we are not. Let us speak to storms. Thank you, Chantal. And please uh, take my place. Thank you. And welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christophe, for this wonderful introduction. But I hope that you do not, uh, not expect me to answer for what answer to your old question, no? Because, in fact, this is you. You've got to uh, work out the way in which the ideas. I'm, I'm very, very uh, pleased to see that my ideas can be you know, interesting for, for, for artists, for architects, for uh, designers. Uh, but the aim is to make you ask questions, you know, pro problematize your practice, and then try to see, you know, how you can develop them. But it's not to, for me <laughs> to tell you uh, what you should do. So that, that I must make, make very clear that uh, I'm not going to provide answer, but I hope that, you know, s some of the reflection that uh, I'm going to present here uh, 
can suscitate some new question uh, for you. I mean, that, that is re really what I would uh, uh, like to be able to do. And I must also say that I'm very glad to uh, be back at Harvard and uh, to speak for the first time at the GSD. So uh, thank you very much for the, the invitation. And um, in, in terms of um, to see what, the, I, I hope we can have after that a real you know, interesting di dialogue between uh, us and Christophe will accompany me, I suppose, also for the discussion to see, because I'm also very interested in, in seeing the way in which, you know, you appropriate my ideas, so, uh, and, and how you develop them. So that's something which is really also ve very interesting for me, and I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot from this uh, uh, lecture. Um, so let's let's begin first by some very uh, uh, brief uh, um, comment about the situation today. In recent years, we have witnessed uh, an incredible acceleration in the process of commodification in the field of culture. With the development of the so-called culture industries, we could say that the worst nightmare of Orkheimer and Adorno seems to have been uh, realized. Indeed, some theories claim that through our dependence on the entertainment corporation, we have become totally subjugated to the control of capital and that we cannot even imagine mode of resistance. Aesthetic, they say, has been so completely harnessed towards the development of an agonistic culture that not even in art is there space left for a subversive experience. In fact, um, in, in his introduction, Christophe referred to the fact that it's obviously some the position which I, I, I criticize. But you know, we, we hear a lot of people saying that we, there is really no possibility for resistance in artistic and cultural practices. And were this to be true, we will have to conclude that there is no alternative to the present world that I've called post-political in my book on the political will mean that the current hegemonic form of neoliberal globalization will therefore constitute our only horizon, and that we will have to abandon the hope of fostering the agonistic democracy that I have been advocating in my work. To be sure, there are many people, in fact, who will rejoice at such a project because they see the present situation as a cause for celebration. And you know, I'm not only speaking of the right here, I'm speaking among you know, some people called progressive because um, in their view, the post-political consensus, the one that I criticize, indicate that with the disappearance of the adversarial model of politics, democracy has become more mature. You know, they see this as, as an important advance for democracy. Uh, and no antagonism has been overcome. We can really have a consensual democracy. Here I'm referring to the work of uh, people like uh, Anthony Giddens, who wrote this book, Beyond Left and Right, or uh, uh, Ulrich Beck. I mean, they, they think that things are going really quite well. Um, well, I disagree with such a view, of course, and I consider that a well-functioning democracy requires a confrontation of democratic political position. If passion cannot be mobilized by traditional democratic parties because they privilege a consensus at the center, no? there is no more uh, distinction between left and right, and we can all uh, agree. Uh, for instance, Tony Blair used to say, we are all middle class, no? so there is no reason for which you know, we should uh, have any disagreement. Uh, of course, things have not improved with the current uh, uh, Cameron um, type of government. But still, uh, the, the problem, and in fact, in the discussion, if you want, we can really uh, raise some issue about that, is that we are still not out of this post-political uh, consensus. And in fact, I think that is, is precisely something which is very, very uh, dangerous. And in fact, this is the reason why I've been interested in the development of right-wing populism, because uh, I want to show uh, in, in that work that when passion are not pop uh, mobilized by uh, uh, in, in that democratic direction, they are uh, 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 they find other outlets in diverse fundamentalist movement or on particularistic demand or non-negotiable moral issue. 
when a society lacks a dynamic democratic life with a real confrontation among a diversity of real alternatives, the terrain is slayed for other form of identification of an ethnic, religious, or nationalist nature, and this leads to the emergence of antagonism that cannot be managed by the democratic process. No? And this is the, the, the reason for which, in my recent work, I've tried to show how it is, in fact, the post-political consensus which characterizes most advanced liberal democratic societies, which is the origin of the growing success of right-wing populist parties. And one must acknowledge that they are often the only ones who challenge the there is no alternative dogma, which is proclaimed by the traditional parties, and attempt mobilizing passion against what they present as the uncaring establishment, and uh, they, they present you know, left and right, democratic and, and uh, uh, parties of left and right est establishment elites, bureaucrats, who did not, who do not uh, listen to the voice of the people, who ignore the real concern of the people, uh, which by the, it's, it's of course the, the truth, but the problem is that they, they pretend that they are going to give back a voice to the people and they or, or orientate those passion in fact in, in xenophobic uh, uh, ways. We can see, for instance, the, what's happening with the success of somebody like Marine Le Pen in France at the, at the moment. Um, but this is, in my view, a consequence of the lack of an agonistic uh, uh, debate in our societies. And the fact that the, 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 the left is not trying to mobilize passion into a democratic direction. And I think that such an evolution clearly represents a threat for democracy. And a central aim of my reflection has been to bring to the fore the danger of post-politics and the urgency of, of revitalizing democracy thanks to the proliferation of a variety of agonistic public spaces. To visualize how an agonistic democracy can be brought about, it is necessary to grasp the challenge facing democratic politics. And this requires an adequate understanding of the terrain in which we have to act. So the point I'm going to make in this presentation is that uh, uh, to answer the question, how are we going to create, uh, uh, foment, uh, foster those agonistic public spaces, we need first to understand what is really the situation today. What uh, uh, is our condition? And then to, to really know the terrain in which we will have to intervene. But that, of course, requires uh, to understand the nature of the transition that advanced industrial societies have undergone in the last decade of the 20th century. Because agonistic public spaces is not something that there is not a recipe uh, uh, that one can be uh, apl applied to all, all situations and, and all cases. And for instance, by the way, I want to think that uh, so what is good for Europe is not necessarily good for the, uh, the United States and certainly not good for the, the, the Middle East. So we need to have something, in fact, here we could uh, uh, quote a break that truth is concrete, you know, and one needs to really understand the specific situation in order to envisage how one can uh, intervene. And this is why I think that th this, to understand the terrain in which we are, we've got to act is very important. And one of the important elements is what has happened, what has been the transition that we've witnessed in, 20, in those, you know, since the la end of the last century. Uh, and I must also uh, insist that this transition has had important consequences in the field of artistic and cultural practices, and of course this is a, a subject that interests me uh, um, recently more and more. And so this is why I've decided to center you know, my presentation on this topic. So what uh, uh, can we say about uh, um, this transition? Well, a great number of theories coming from a variety of theoretical perspectives <coughs> agree that advanced industrial societies if at the end of the century witness a transition which they present, you know, according to, 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 to their different orientation, as in some cases they see the transition from industrial to post-industrial society, uh, 
some speak of a transition from Fordism to post-Fordism, or uh, transition from a disciplinary society to the society of control. Um, there are many different uh, ways, according to different theories. And I'm going to concentrate my reflection on the transition from Fordism to post-Fordism, because I think that it is today the most influential one. Uh, but I want here to mention that, in fact, those approaches are not necessarily incompatible. And in fact, they can be combined. Um, well, not, this is not true for, for, for the first one, industrial to post-industrial, because, of course, this is the less interesting, the one in which there is no uh, real role for politics, or the development of technology, and, and th this is really the, the one which leads to thinking, but there is a fate, there is absolutely, uh, absolutely nothing we can do. Uh, but uh, the, the other one, the one post for the, and, and the, uh, the one that refers to uh, the, the transition between disciplinary to uh, society to consciousness, those are in fact uh, often combined. And uh, I'm going to give an example of that. Um, so let's now speak a little bit about the transition from Fordim to post Fordim and see, I'm going to present here two different views about, about this transition. To apprehend what it has taken in the transition from Fordim to post Fordim, I think it is useful to examine the differences between the approach influenced by the critical theory of Adorno and Horkheimer, and those which are influenced by the Italian autonomist tradition, the tradition which is sometimes also referred to uh, uh, operaismo, so autonomist, post-operaist, post-operaist, um, this uh, refer to the same uh, uh, form of, of approach. The, the, so it's interesting to come pair the, the, the one of Horkheimer and Adorno with the autonomous post operais. Their main disagreement lies in the role that the culture industry has played in the transformation of capitalism. It's well known that Horkheimer and Adorno saw the development of the culture industry as the moment when the Fordist model of production finally managed to enter the field of culture. And they see this evolution as a further stage in the process of commodification and subjugation of society to the requisite of capitalist production. For Paolo Virno and some other post operaist theorists, in fact, it's exactly the contrary that, that happened. Because they believe that the culture industry has played an important role in the process of transition between Fordism and post-Fordism, because it is there that the new practice of production emerged, which have led to the overcoming of Fordism. So they, they, they see that as a process not negative, like, like Horkheimer and Adorno, you know, uh, it's, it's a progress for them. Of course, some of them you know, will see that they're ambivalent, but they see that as a progress. And for instance, they uh, uh, insist on the fact that the space granted to the informal, the unexpected, and the unplanned, which for Horkheimer and Adorno were seen as an uninfluential remnant of the past. Uh, they are presented, for instance, by Paolo Virno as anticipatory omens. And so something that goes to so permit creation of new form, it goes toward the future. With the development of Immaterial labor, immaterial labor is a category which is absolutely central for the post operaist uh, and of course they refer to, to the new you know, communication industries. They, those elements began to play an increasingly important role and they opened the way for new form of social relations. So as I was saying uh, before, they, they see that as, 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 a, as a progress, as, as something which you know, open new form of sociability. In advanced capitalism, say Virno, the labor process has become performative and it mobilizes the most universal requisite of the species, for instance, perception, language, memory, and feelings. He uh, say that contemporary production is virtuosic and that productive labor in its totality appropriate the special characteristic of the performing artist. According to Virno, then the culture industry is in fact the matrix of post-Fordism. 
theories influenced by the autonomous tradition concord on the fact that the transition from Fordism to post-Fordism need to be understood not as dictated by lo the logic of development of the capitalist forces of production, I mean, in, in that sense, so uh, th those are people who come from Marxism, but who differentiate themselves from Marxism precisely because, they, 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 and that's what happened with the m start of the movement called Operaismo, because they say, no, it's not the productive forces uh, uh, um, that you know are the motor of history, it's the worker struggle. And, and, and th this is an idea that they developed in the early 70s, but that is still very central to, to, to their view. So for them, it's not the development of capitalist forces of production, but the reaction of capitalism to the new practice of resistance of the workers. You know, this, this is what is, is the motto. So they, they agree on that, and this, this is what is common to the, the, this position. This agreement exists, however, among them concerning the political consequences of this transition. Although many of them use the notion of the multitude to refer to the new type of political agent, which is characteristic of the current period, they said we can't speak anymore of the proletariat, you know, this new immaterial worker, uh, they refer to it in that it's a multitude. So that they, they, they agree on that, but they do not envisage the future of the multitude in the same way. For instance, it's well known, I'm sure you've read uh, some of their words, that uh, uh, Michael Hart and Antonio Negri celebrate in the multitude the emergence of a new revolutionary subject, which will necessarily bring down the new form of domination embodied in what they call empire. Empire being the, 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 the all, also a term to refer to the, the, the in, in, in new form of, of, of uh, sovereignty or post-sovereignty existing at the, at the uh, uh, international level. So here I want to insist that those people incorporate, but very often in a not very fruitful way, some of the analysis of Foucault and Deleuze. Uh, and this is where they insist, for instance, that the end of the disciplinary regime, disciplinary regime is a term coined by Michel Foucault in uh, the, the book which refers more clearly to that is his book, Surveiller et Punir. Hein? Uh, uh, do you say that in English? Uh, uh, Discipline and Punish, yes. Um, so they, 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 and, 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 uh, um, and Deleuze, because Deleuze is the one who coined the term of uh, 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 control society. Um, and th they, they follow uh, Deleuze and um, Foucault, and they assert that the end of the disciplinary regime, um, that was exercised over bodies in enclosed space like school, factories, and asylum, that uh, Foucault uh, uh, studies in discipline and publish, and the replacement by the procedure of control linked to the growth of the network. This is, they say, leading to a new type of governance, which opens the way to more autonomous and independent form of subjectivity. With the expansion of new form of cooperative communication and the invention of new communicative form of life, those subjectivities can express themselves freely and they will contribute to the formation of a new set of social relations that will finally replace the capitalist system. So that, this is the view of, of Art and Negri, that uh, the multitude will necessarily bring down empire, and this is the, they see the process of globalization as, as they celebrate globalization because they think this is creating the condition for the, the, the victory of the multitude. Paolo Virno which is also another post imperialist while agreeing on the potential open by new form of life, uh, is not so sanguine about the future. And he sees the growth of the multitude as an ambivalent phenomenon. For instance, he is also insisting on the need to acknowledge the new form of subjectivation and precarization, which are typical of the post-Fordist stage. He said, it's true that the 
people are not as passive as before. Huh? The, 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 not, they are not on the assembly line like the tell machine. No, the, the, the new form of post forwarding make more room for autonomy. Um, but it is because they have now become active actors of their own precarization. So it's, it's, it's not something which is necessarily uh, better. No, uh, there, are, there is an interesting pos, pos, there are some possibilities, but at the moment, in fact, it, it, it is the auto exploitation instead of being you know, exploited by uh, uh, di directly by the capitalist. So instead of seeing the generalization of immaterial labor as a type of spontaneous communism like uh, uh, Art and Negri, Virno tends to see post Fordism as the manifestation of what he called the communism of capital. Despite those differences, you know, about the, 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 the role of the multitude, there is something that all the post operaist thinkers have in common. And it is their conviction that it is necessary to relinquish the conception of radical politics aim at taking power in order to control the institution of the state. They claim that one should ignore the existing power structure and to dedicate oneself to constructing alternative form outside the state power network and outside existing institution. For instance, Birno asserts that it is in the refusal to work and in the different form of exodus and disobedience that one should locate any possibility of emancipation. Any majoritarian model of society that will be organized on the state is to be rejected and replaced by another model of organization of the multitude, which is deemed to be mu more universal. And this is new model is the form of a unity provided by commonplace of the mind, cognitive, linguistic, habit, and the general intellect. I mean, as you can see, th those are ideas which are uh, quite influential in the Occupy movement, for instance. Uh, uh, um, I, I, I'm, I find that very problematic, but uh, uh, we could have a discussion about that uh, uh, later. So this is the presentation of no, the, 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 view, the view of the, the, the post operaist. Um, and now I want to say, uh, oh, I, I propose to see uh, this transition myself. Well, I must begin by saying that I agree, of course, with them on the necessity to uh, acknowledge the fundamental transformation in the mode of regulation of capitalism, which are represented by the transition to post forward. But this is why I insist on we need to understand what are the uh, analysis of the concrete situation you know, in order to think how we are going to act. But I think that we should envisage this transition from the point of view of the theory of hegemony. I recognize the importance of not seeing the transformation undergone by our society, so the mere consequence of technological progresses, like you know the, trans the, the view which say that is a transition from industrial to post-industrial society, <laughs> and that it is absolutely central to bring to the fore the political dimension of the transition. As uh, 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 the, the French social theorist André Gors already you know, in the 60s uh, uh, has pointed out, the, the, he, he saw it really since, since the beginning, uh, uh, the, the very origin of this, this transition. He, uh, um, he in, insists that they should be understood as a move by capital to provide what was a fundamentally political answer to the crisis of governability that uh, it, it's basically, I mean, the end of the 60s, the beginning of the, of the 70s. Many factors have contributed to this transition, and it is important, I think, to grasp the complexity of this, the dynamic of this transition. My problem with the operaist and post operaist view is that by putting the almost exclusive emphasis on the worker struggle, they tend to see this transition as if it was exclusively moved by one single logic on the worker resistance to the process of exploitation, forcing the capitalists to reorganize the process of production and to move to the post for this era of immaterial labor. According to them, capitalism 
can only be reactive. And here, there is a big difference uh, with uh, Deleuze and Guattari, uh, because this is not a view of, of Deleuze and Guattari. They, uh, Deleuze and Guattari also recognize that capitalism could be uh, uh, react, uh, um, active. And for instance, the, uh, Deleuze and Guattari never refused to accept that uh, uh, capitalism could have a creative uh, uh, role. But for the, the autonomies, uh, uh, no, it's only uh, uh, the creativity of the worker and, and the reaction from the capitalists, but they don't see that as a you know, process of uh, a, a, what I call an hegemonic struggle between capital and, and labor. So, in fact, what the, 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 my main problem with this approach is that they deny the role played in the transition by the hegemonic uh, uh, struggle. But maybe I should uh, uh, here briefly clarify what I understand by the hegemonic struggle, because I can't suppose that everybody uh, uh, is being student of uh, uh, Christophe and have read my work. Um, so let me just give a few uh, basic tenets of my theoretical framework. According to the approach that I'm advocating, and which has been developed originally in hegemony and socialist strategy, the whole that, the book that I wrote jointly with Ernesto Laclau, two key concepts are necessary to grasp the nature of the political. On one side, antagonism, on the other side, hegemony. On one side, it is necessary to acknowledge the dimension of what I propose to call the political, as the ever-present possibility of antagonism. And this requires, on the other side, coming to terms with the lack of a final ground and the undesignability that pervades every order. And this is precisely what it means, recognizing the hegemonic nature of every kind of social order and envisaging society as the product of a series of practices whose aim is to establish order, but always in a context of contingency. The practices of articulation through which a given order is created and the meaning of social institution is fixed, this is what we call hegemonic practices. Every order is the temporary and precarious articulation of contingent practices. That, that is one of the fundamental theses of hegemony and socialist strategy. And it means that things could always have been otherwise, and that every order is predicated on the exclusion of other possibilities. It is always the expression of a particular structure of power relation. So what is at a given moment accepted as the natural order, jointly with the common sense. Here I'm using common sense in, in the way in which Gramsci uh, used it. Uh, uh, not not you know, com what is common, but what uh, common sense is always the result of an hegemonic construction. Uh, um, this is always the result of what we call sedimented hegemonic practices. I mean, hegemonic practices who have become so naturalized that people have forgotten their, their, their uh, political origin. So it, an order is never the manifestation of a deeper objectivity that will be exterior to the practice that bring this order into being. Every order is therefore susceptible of being challenged by counter-hegemonic practices which will attempt to disarticulate this order and to install another form of hegemony. This is a very important thesis for me because I, I think it's the best way in which we, we can uh, criticize the, the uh, there is no alternative view which is so central today. You know, say, no, once we recognize that the, the order that exists today, uh, the neoliberal uh, uh, order, is the result of hegemonic practices, that other possibilities have been excluded, then we can see that, oh, you know, we can intervene. That thing, an, another world is possible to, to use the, the term of the alter globalization movement. And this is, you know, what we should try to uh, uh, bring about. I would like not to, that this is just, you know, very briefly to, to, to remind you what I understand by the hegemony. But now I would like not to suggest that in order to introduce the hegemonic dimension 
in the transition between Fordism and post Fordism, because what I'm saying, I, I, I don't agree with the, view, the, uh, the way in which this transition is understood by Art and Negri, and, and, I, and I insist that it should be seen in, uh, uh, from an hegemonic point of view. And I have found interesting insight in the, transi in the, 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 the interpretation of this transition, which has been put forward by Luke Boltanski and Yves Chapello in, uh, uh, in a book that, you know, I'm sure it has been translated into uh, uh, English. It's called The New Spirit of Capitalism, but it is translated into English, and I'm sure that some of you might have read it. In their book, they bring to light the whole pledge, but what they call artistic practice, criti critique, sorry, in the transformation undergone by capitalism in the last decade of the 20th century, precisely a transition from Fordin to post Fordin. Well, here I want to, to say that I think it's unfortunate that they uh, 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 use that term artistic critique because it has led to misinterpretation. For instance, I know many artists who uh, uh, consider that this to, is, is to say, ah, it's the artists who are uh, 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 responsible for the development of neoliberalism. Uh, this is the, the, the artist. But ar by artistic practices, in fact, what they refer is to the demand of autonomy of the new movement of the 60s, uh, the counterculture. And they want to show all those demands have been harnessed in the development of the post for this network economy and transform into new form of control. So the aesthetic strategies of the counterculture, this is what really I, they call artistic critique, uh, uh, the search for authenticity, the ideal of self-management, the anti-hierarchical exigency, and, it, and, and, and of course, it's not you know uh, the, the specific activity of, of the artists. It's, it's a whole movement which put forward those ideas. But those uh, demands have been recuperated by capitalism and used to promote the condition required by the current mode of capitalist regulation. And this is what has contributed to replace the disciplinary framework. Uh, which that was characteristic of the uh, uh, for this period and allow for the society of control. Nowadays, artistic and cultural production play a central role in the process of capital valorization. I mean, that's uh, it's a fact. And through what they call neo-management, artistic critique has become an important element of capitalist productivity. From my point of view, what is interesting in this approach is that it revealed that a crucial dimension of the transition from Fordism to post-Fordism was what I will call a process of discursive rearticulation of existing elements. And this is what uh, permits us to apprehend it as an hegemonic struggle. To be sure, Boltanski and Chapello never use this vocabulary of, 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 of hegemony, uh, but I think that there is a clear example of what Gramsci has called an hegemony through neutralization, or sometimes he also use the term passive revolution, to refer to situations where demands which challenge an established hegemonic order are recuperated by the existing system, and they recuperate them in, in a very specific way. They satisfy those demands, but in a way that is that neutralize the subversive potential. I mean, we could also here use uh, 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 um, le, the, the situationist term detournement. Uh, this is clearly a case of detournement. You know, you we take a demand which is subversive, and then you, you, you uh, 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 transform it, but you, you satisfy it, but in a, in a way which eliminates the, the subversive potential. This is what Gramsci called an hegemony through neutralization or passive revolution. And I think that is clearly what, 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 what uh, uh, happened uh, uh, in, in the, this transition. So I think that once we understand this transition from Fordism to post-Fordism in such a mode, then we 
can see that the, it was an hegemonic move by capital to re-establish its leading role and to reassert its legitimacy. By adding to the analysis offered by the new spirit of capitalism, the in undeniable role played in this transition by the worker resistance. I mean, I, I, I think that I, not, not that I want you know, to eliminate that, but I think that it is important to arrive to a more complex understanding uh, of the force at play in the emergence of the current neoliberal hegemony. This hegemony is the result of a set of political intervention in a complex field of economic, legal, and ideological forces. It is a discursive construction that articulates in a very specific manner a manifold of practices, discourse, and language game of a very different nature. Through a process of what I've called sedimentation, the political origin of those contingent practices has been erased, and this is why they have become naturalized. Neoliberal practices and institutions appear as the outcome of natural processes and the form of identification that they have produced have crystallized in identities that are taken for granted. And this is all the common sense which constitute the framework for what is possible and uh, impossible today, what is legitimate and not legitimate, has been constructed. So to challenge neoliberalism, it is therefore vital to transform this framework. And this requires the production of new subjectivities capable of subverting the existing hegemony. Today's capitalism relies increasingly on semiotic techniques in order to create the mode of subjectivation which are necessary for its reproduction. In modern production, what Foucault called the control of the souls, plays a strategic role in governing affects and passion. The form of exploitation characteristic of the time when manual labor was dominant you know, for this time have been replaced by new one, which requires constantly creating new needs and an incessant desire for the acquisition of goods. Of course, this is what explains the crucial role pl played by advertising in our consumer societies. It is, in fact, the very identity of the consumer which is at stake in the technique of advertising. Those techniques are not limited to promote uh, specific products, but they really aim at producing fantasy world with which the consumer of good will identify. Indeed, nowadays, to buy something is to enter a specific world, to become part of an imagined community. And to maintain its hegemony, the neoliberal system needs permanent, to permanently mobilize people's desire and shape their identities. And of course, this is why the cultural terrain occupies today such a strategic place. To be sure, the realm of culture has always been an important element. I mean, it has been in fact central to an hegemonic politics. Uh, so in, it's not completely new. But in the time of post for this production, the role of the, the, the field of culture has become absolutely crucial. And a counter-hegemonic politics should engage with this terrain so as to further other form of identification. And this is how, how we can uh, intervene. Now that, no, that I have presented the main line of the hegemonic approach to the transition from Fordism to post Fordism, I would like to make some consideration concerning the construction of counter-hegemonic practices and the, you know, the fostering of agonistic public uh, spaces. And it's clear that once social reality is envisaged in terms of hegemonic practices, the process of critique characteristic of radical politics cannot consist, as in the view advocated by the post operaist theorist to whom I have referred earlier, in withdrawing from the existing institution, but no, the strategy of exodus, but at the contrary, in engaging with them so as to disarticulate the existing discourses and practices through which a current hegemony is established and reproduced. Such a counter-hegemonic struggle cannot merely consist in separating the different elements whose 
discursive articulation is the origin of those practice and institution. The second moment, the moment of re-articulation is crucial. So the, the process of hegemony is always a process of disarticulation, re-articulation. Otherwise, we, if, we, if we limit oneself to the process of disarticulation, we could encounter a chaotic situation of pure dissemination, leaving the door open for attempts of re-articulation by non-progressive forces. And we must recognize that we have many historical examples of situations in which the crisis of the dominant order led to right-wing solution. In fact, more, more, more often it is what has happened. So it is why this process of you know, double uh, articulation, re-articulation is important, and I want to emphasize it. It is also important <coughs> not to envisage this struggle as the displacement of a supposedly false consciousness, a displacement that would reveal the true reality, because such a perspective would be completely at odds with the anti-essentialist premise of the theory of hegemony, which rejects the very idea of a true consciousness. Sorry. <coughs> to drink more. My voice is going. Oh. <coughs> <coughs> it never happened to me before. But. Okay, let me just <coughs> take it. So, so the, the, the theory of hegemony rejects the very idea of true consciousness and assert that identities are always the result of processes of identification. It is through insertion in a manifold of practices, discourse, and language game that spe specific form of individualities are constructed. According to the hegemonic approach, and I want to insist on that, social reality is discursively constructed, and the political is a primary structuring role in this construction because social relations are ultimately contingent. Any prevailing articulation results from an antagonistic confrontation whose outcome is not decided in advance. What is therefore needed is a strategy whose objective is through a set of counter-hegemonic intervention will disarticulate the existing hegemony and establish a new, a more democratic one thanks to a process of re-articulation of old and new elements. And of course, the, the aim is to create a different new configuration of power. And this is why the transformation of political identities cannot consist in a rationalist appeal to the true <laughs> interest of the subject, but in its insertion in practices that would mobilize its effect toward the disarticulation of the framework in which the process of identification is taking place. And in fact, the aim is to open the way for other form of identification. If we follow such an approach, we can understand why the aim of the social movement should be the construction of opo or, or uh, the, the social movement, but also, you know, of, of any, any form of critical uh, uh, practices should uh, be the construction of oppositional identities. But I want also to insist again, uh, 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 even if uh, from a different ang angle on the same idea here, is that this cannot consist simply, uh, because that, uh, it's an idea that one uh, finds quite often to, in, in form of critical air, process of de-identification, or some people speak of de-individualization, because the second move, the one of what I would call re-identification or re-individualization is decisive. To insist only on the first move is in fact to remain trapped in a problematic which postulates that the negative movement is sufficient on its own to bring about something positive. And so this idea in a sense uh, um, supposes that new subjectivities are already there 
ready to emerge when the weight of the dominant ideology will be lifted. And of course, such a view completely fails to come to terms with the nature of the hegemonic struggle and the complex process of construction of identities. That the critique and disarticulation of the existing hegemony needs to be accompanied by a process of rearticulation is something that is missed by all approaches in terms of reification of forced consciousness, you know, the traditional Marxist approach, the forced ideology, the, the, the workers are not aware of their true uh, interest because of the uh, uh, dominant ideology, and then it's a question of lift the dominant ideology. Uh, but, uh, um, so it's something that probably you know many, many people will will find uh, uh, rather problematic. But I want to insist that it's also missed, in a different way, by the theorists of the multitude, who believe that the oppositional consciousness of the multitude does not require political articulation, and this leads them to evacuate what I take to be the crucial question for a democratic politics how to establish a chain of equivalence among the different democratic struggles. Those struggles do not automatically converge, and they might even often conflict with each other. The aim of radical democratic politics, here of course I'm taking the, the, the position because in the agonistic struggle you've got different positions which uh, uh, are struggling. And one of those positions is, I mean, that will be the one that I defend, the, the, to struggle for a radicalization of democracy. And if this is you know, the aim, that one if, I think that it is important to provide surface of inscription where the different demand uh, could be articulated around what Gramsci called a collective will. And I think that, uh, uh, in fact, to, for the creation of a collective will, uh, artistic and cultural practices can play an important role and can play an important role in, the, in this agonistic struggle because they are a privileged terrain for the construction of new subjectivities. Uh, just think, for instance, of the success uh, of feminist artistic practices in revealing how the construction of images contributed to the construction and reproduction of oppressive social norms and also by offering alternative view. So th this, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that this terrain of, of cultural and artistic practices is crucial for the agonistic struggle. To re revitalize democracy in our post-political societies, what is urgently needed is to foster the multiplication of agonistic public spaces where everything that the dominant consensus tend to obscure and obliterate and this to bring this to, to, to light. This, this is a point on which uh, uh, Christophe has already uh, made reference, but this, this is really for me something which is absolutely central. Um, till what time can we stay? Because I've got a, a last point which I would like to make, but if, if I'm over the time, I can skip it. I can go on, yes? Okay, good. Uh, <coughs> So here it's a point which, which I, 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 I think, uh, um, I feel more and more, I need to clarify this because I felt that there has been some confusion around my, my idea of, of uh, agonism. Um, because, of course, I'm not the only one to use this, con this concept of agonism. We are, we are several agonistic theories. What we have in common is, we, is, is our opponent, which is the, ag the model of aggregative democracy or the model of uh, uh, deliberative democracy. Uh, uh, so the agonistic theories, we, we, we are uh, uh, several, uh, as you know, that, that term. But um, there are also very important differences among us. And this is the point which I, 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 I want to clarify because I think this is crucial for the, the, the issue of you know, radical politics, which is the one that I, I want to address uh, here. Uh, and here I want to insist that in spite of a similar terminology, my agonistic approach differs from many understanding of agonism, which has been put forward recently. For instance, it clearly differs from the one of Anna Arendt. 
in my view, the main problem uh, with Arendt's understanding of agonism, uh, I, she, it, she does not, by the way, use it that much. She, she refers very much to the agon. Uh, but a lot of contemporary political theories have appropriated that and present, you know, Arendt as uh, one agonist uh, uh, the uh, theorist. But I want here to claim that Arendt understanding of agonism, I will call it an agonism without antagonism. What I mean is that while Arendt puts great emphasis on human plurality and insists that politics deal with the community and reciprocity of human beings, which are different. I mean, this is a central point of, of her view. She never acknowledges that this plurality is at the origin of antagonistic conflicts. According to her, to think politically is to develop the ability to see things from a multiplicity of perspective. As a reference to Kant and Kant's idea of enlarged thought testify, Arendt pluralism is finally not fundamentally different from the liberal conception that we find, for instance, in Habermas, uh, because it is inscribed in the horizon of an intersubjective agreement. This is why I say it's, it's pluralism without antagonism. Indeed, what Aaron looked for in Kant's doctrine of the aesthetic judgment is a procedure for ascertaining intersubjective agreement in the public space. Here I'm referring to her book, uh, Kant Lecture on Political Philosophy. In fact, she finds the political philosophy of Kant in the, in the third critique, in the critique of judgment, which of course is not about political philosophy, it's about uh, 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 aesthetic judgment. But, but she said, no, this has got important uh, consequences uh, 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 for politics, pa particularly the idea of enlarged thought and uh, the fact that it's possible to create an intersubjective agreement. Uh, um, and I think that uh, this is why, uh, despite of significant differences, and that I want, don't want to deny, uh, uh, with, uh, for instance, the position of, of Habermas, Arendt, like Habermas, end up envisaging the public space in a consensual way. To be sure, in the case of Arendt, the consensus uh, is going to be reached uh, not as, as uh, 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 by some kind of rational discourse like in Habermas, but it results from the exchanges of voice and opinion, opinion in the great sense of, 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 of doxa. Uh, that uh, here, for instance, I think it's useful the way this has been interpreted by uh, feminist, uh, an American feminist uh, political theorist, Linda Zerilli. She uh, has noted that while for Habermas, consensus emerged through what Kant called disputieren, that is an exchange of argument constrained by logical rules, in the case of Aaron, is a, a, a question of streite, that is agreement are produced through persuasion, not through irrefutable truth. However, I will say, neither of them is able to acknowledge the hegemonic nature of every form of the consen of consensus and the ineradicability of antagonism, what we could call, using again a, a German term, the Widerstreit. Or uh, uh, we can also here make reference to, to what Jean uh, um, Lyotard uh, called le différent. Uh, the, 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 this is something which, of course, has no place in, in uh, our own reflection. And here I also want to insist that my conception of agonism differ from the one clearly inspired by Arendt that the, the, the American political theorist Bonnie Onik has put forward in her book, Political Theory and the Displacement of Politics. According to Onik, there are two perspectives on politics. One she, she called the virtu uh, uh, and the virtu. Virtu, she referred mainly, mainly to Machiavelli. For her, at the core of the virtu perspective, and this is the one that she advocates, uh, is the agonistic struggle through which citizens are impeding to close off policies and ideas from debate and manage to keep them open to challenge. So for, for them, this is what the agonistic struggle is about, to, uh, in co constant contestation, in, 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 not uh, uh, any point in which uh, uh, no, no point of closure. That is for her what is important. 
I do not disagree with the importance of this dimension, but I do not think that one can understand the nature of the agonistic struggle simply in terms of an ongoing contestation over issue and identities. One also needs to grasp the crucial role of hegemonic articulation and the necessity not only of challenging the, what exists, but also of constructing new articulation and, and new institution. You know, not only con are open to this, but, but we need to propose a new, 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 new form. And I find the same limitation in the conception uh, uh, which has been put forward by another agonist theorist, also an American, William Connolly. Connolly is influenced by Nietzsche not by Aachen, and he has tried to make the Nietzschean conception of the agon compatible with democratic politics. He calls also for a radicalization of democracy, but by that he understands the cultivation by citizens of a new democratic ethos, an ethos of engagement which drives them to engage in agonistic contestation and to disturb all the attempt of closure. So it's very similar to, to, to the view of, of uh, uh, Bonnie Onik. Uh, question of disturbance, contestation. Uh, um, central to Connolly's vision is the notion of what he calls agonistic respect, that he sees us emerging from the shared existential condition of the struggle for identity and as shaped by the recognition of our finitude. Agonistic respect represents for Connolly the cardinal virtue of deep pluralism, and it is the most important political virtue in our contemporary pluralistic world. Well, I think that this is certainly an attractive uh, uh, vision, but I do not think that uh, it can provide the framework for an effective democratic politics. Because there are a series of questions that we should ask, and that Connolly never ask. What should be the limit of this agonistic respect? Uh, all, all positions should be, you know, we should uh, treat, treat them in the same way, or are there some which we are not going to, to, to accept? And, of course, the question here is to ask, how can such a vision challenge the dominant hegemony? and transform the existing relation of power. And as I said, this is, uh, 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 those are questions that I consider to be central po for politics and that the Connolly's approach does not allow us to address. And I think that despite, of, uh, uh, let's say, if he was saying that he, what he wants to, to, to offer is a, only a new democratic ethos, I will not disagree with that. I think that, uh, but he, pretend that he is offering a new form of democratic politics. And, and this is where I, I, can, I can follow him, because I think that while what in fact he offers is a, 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 a conception of that really is limited to the level of the ethical. I'm not saying, of course, that there is no relation between ethics and politics, but that is not, is not the same thing. But to, to take a political decision implies something different. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, I don't think that the view like the one of Connolly is enough to ex envisage the hegemonic struggle and a truly political approach, of course, requires engaging with the institutional uh, uh, domain, not simply, you know, contestation, pure, uh, 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 because the difference here, of course, is that uh, um, the, the, the view, my view of agonism insists on the uh, 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 fact of conflict. They are conflict. <laughs> conflict that need to be resolved. There is the moment of decision. While, while for, for, for the other agonists, it's contestation, you know, leave it open. To, but there is the, what is Ill, Ill not present, there is the moment of, of the decision. And I would say that, in my view, the main shortcoming of the agonistic approach influenced by Aaron and Nietzsche is that their main focus is the struggle against closure. And this is why they are not able to grasp the nature of the hegemonic struggle. Their celebration of a politics of disturbance ignores the other side of the hegemonic struggle. I mean, of course, this is one side of the hegemonic struggle. It's what I refer for the process of disarticulation. 
But there is the other side, which is the establishment of a chain of equivalence among democratic struggle and the construction of an alternative hegemony. Of course, this can be done in a multiplicity of ways, the construction of an alternative hegemony. Um, but it will always require a moment of closure, a moment of, of saying, you know, th this is where are the limits of the agonistic uh, struggle. Uh, and, and this is where I think that an, an, a really political approach need to insist on that. And uh, uh, I, in fact, want to end by, uh, uh, there is a tool that I want to share with you is that radical politics understood in that way uh, uh, um, can only be successful if it's envisaged on the mode of what Gramsci called a war of position. Uh, um, a war of position aim at transforming the existing institution and creating a new hegemony to develop a process of radicalization of democracy is not enough to unsettle the dominant procedure and to disrupt the existing arrangement. And of course, this is also why uh, I think that it can't be simply a, 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 a situation of exodus, you know, abandoning the, 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 because here I, dist I have a distinguish between what I call a strategy of uh, withdrawal from, which is the strategy of exodus of the person and the strategy of engagement with. And the strategy that I want to defend is that a, a, a more adequate for uh, an agonistic politics that aim at the process of radicalization of democracy is a process of engagement with the institution in order to transform the, the, them. When we acknowledge, as I have argued at the beginning, that antagonism is ineradicable and that every order is an hegemonic order, we cannot avoid facing the core question of politics. What are the limits of agonism? And what are the institution and the form of power that are more suitable for process of radicalization of democracy? This requires that we do not elude the moment of decision. And as I just say, this will necessarily imply some form of closure. Maybe we can avoid this if we think only in ethical terms, but not if we want to pose political question. Thank you. Going there. Do I have more water there? Yeah. Thank you, Chantal. Uh, of course, the question that I posed were not for you to answer. <laughs> they were the ones I generated for myself and also speaking to some of my colleagues for, for us, designers and artists. Uh, so in fact, we will not have those questions without discussing and reading your text. But I have uh, a question that uh, I'm sure many other people would like to ask. Speaking of not so much anti-hegemonic practice, but maybe it's called unhegemonic or rehegemonic. Or, or re hegemonic No, no, but, but I mean unhegemonic and or what? Unhegemonic. Yeah, but the second or? Oh, see, speaking of disarticulation and rearticulation. <laughs> Uh, what, uh, how would you, how do you see uh, Occupy movement? Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> well, uh, Occupy, first I want, I want to, 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 to say that one uh, uh, need to make question concrete. Uh, um, 
Occupy movement, oh, in fact, that, that's the problem because Occupy, first I will say in, 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 in the US, uh, because I think there is very, uh, I, I, I've, I've seen, for instance, uh, uh, recently some kind of basic generation, the, the Occupy movement in which they put everything, you know, the, that, that uh, well, the, 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 the Arab awakening, then situation in Greece, situation in Ignatius in Spain, the, 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 the thing in uh, um, Israel, some people put even the riots in, in London last year, and in this, uh, they put the, the, the um, move, student movement in Chile. I mean, they, they, they are saying, oh, there is the, well, those movements are all, all of them very, very different, so we can't, cannot, uh, and I, I think that I'm, I'm, I'm re I could say something about uh, uh, what I think about the Occupy movement in, in America, but no, no, I'm just coming from New York, I realize, and I've been in touch with, with uh, 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 many people there involved with them. They say to me that, for instance, there is also a lot of diversity between the different Occupy in different uh, places. They said Occupy movement in New York is different from the one in Philadelphia. I don't know if there was one in Boston. In fact, I've never, you asked there one? Is okay. one. There uh, is there, one. There is the very one in, in Oakland. So it's very difficult to, 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 to speak, you know. Uh, uh, as far as the US is concerned, I mean, the, I, I could probably say only about Occupy in New York, which is the one that, uh, that uh, I know a, a little bit. Um, but, um, hmm, how can I, uh, let's say, of course I am, I, I, I am basically sympathetic and I think that is very important suddenly that pe people have, have said, well, that's enough, you know. And I, I uh, um, when I want, in fact, I think I could clarify my position uh, by, by uh, uh, contrasting two Occupy, well, a movement which, uh, 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 I see very differently. For instance, I'm very critical of the indignados in Spain. Uh, and I'm going to explain why in a moment. Uh, uh, but I'm much more sympathetic to Occupy Wall Street. Uh, the indignados in Spain, they have no, uh, uh, what, uh, what I like about Occupy Wall Street is that they define an adversary. You know, there is uh, Occupy Wall Street. So we know who is the adversary, and I don't think there can be any form of radical politics without defining an adversary. The uh, doing the now in Spain is democracia real, yeah. We want real democracy, no. But what, uh, 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 what does that mean? Uh, they, they don't want any leader, they don't want any structure, they want anything to do with parties, they, they, they only want some kind of direct democracy uh, in which everybody will participate in order to create consensus. So you can imagine how I react when, 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 when I heard that the, the aim of democratic politics is create, create consensus. Uh, uh, um, but what I find really problematic in, uh, uh, is that so far, the, 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 the result, well, I, 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 I don't want to, to say that they are the only responsible for the victory of the right in Spain. That's certainly not the case. But they have contributed to, to the victory of, of, of the right. Uh, because the, the first uh, uh, election that took place after the movement were uh, in a regional elections, which are very important in Spain because of the autonomia. And for the first time, the, 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 the except in, 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 in Andalusia, uh, um, the, 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 the Partido Popular is, is, is in control of everything. Then, of course, the, the, the election in uh, uh, the national election, same thing. You know, they, the Partido Popular won an absolute majority. Well, because, of course, the, 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 the uh, Occupy was uh, saying, we sh people, you should not uh, uh, go to the election. You should not, not, uh, not, not vote. So all the people who, uh, uh, oh, let's say, but many people who would have voted for the PSOE, uh, the socialists, did not vote. And it's not that the, the, the right won more vote than before. Simply the only people who went to vote were the people who were voting for the right. And uh, in November, I, I, I met some of, of, of the people who are involved in Occupy, in in, 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 in London, and, and I told them, but do you realize what, what the consequence of, of, of your things? The, uh, uh, this was after the, 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 the regional election. And they say, oh, well, we don't mind, you know, doesn't matter for us, because there is no difference between the PSOE and, and the Partido Popular. 
if, if the consequence of our uh, uh, call is to bring the body to life, that's so be it. It does not make any, I, I find that really worrying. In fact, no, they are, they are beginning to realize that, you know, to have Parti Popular in power, uh, they, because they, 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 Rajoy is having a politic of austerity, which is strong. But I, they, they, you know, this is why I, a movement like that, like that I find very problematic. It doesn't seem to be the case, uh, uh, so far as I know, with, with the Occupy in, uh, in New York, at least. For instance, what I find very positive is that they, they, they Occupy Wall Street, Second thing is that they are working with uh, trade unions. They have been, they are doing a lot of things with the AFSL-CIO, which I think is very positive. So they don't have uh, 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 this thing. We don't want to do anything to do with politicians. And also uh, 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 concerning the election, what uh, 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 all the people I've been speaking to, they Voting say they will vote for Obama. Yeah. Uh, 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 they are certainly not going to, to, to uh, call for not voting. They say, but that I understand perfectly, that they don't want to begin doing the campaign of Obama, which is fair enough, you know, the, uh, but they are not anti. Uh, uh, so I, I, I think that that is certainly something which is much more uh, 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 realistic. And then um, one thing which I'm a bit, uh, 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 the, 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 the dominant view is, is uh, uh, the anarchists are very important there. Eh? Uh, uh, and and, and uh, I, I think that uh, um, we had a conversation yeah, yeah, about yeah. this in Wrocław. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think that uh, uh, you know th th this is uh, this I find problematic because uh, uh, all the strategy of war of position that that I, I, I've presented here. Uh, of course, it's a strategy which is not at all the anarchist one. It's to say you need to get involved. But let's say on the whole, I well, what I find really interesting, uh, 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 I mean, they're definitely uh, co uh, contributing to, to, to some kind of agonistic yes. intervention, absolutely. Uh, uh, they are uh, uh, already, I mean, uh, it seems so at least because not living here, but people, they've managed to, to introduced in the public discourse a series of, of issues which were not present. Uh, for instance, I, what I found really very important, particularly here in, in, in the US, is that they're putting uh, the, the idea of equality very much at the center. Uh, uh, and this is an idea, I've always been struck by the fact that people on, many people on the left here, that uh, liberty, 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 but, but the term of equality is not something which is very present in the, so the fact that, you know, this movement is, is putting the idea of equality, I think, no, I, 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 I think it's really uh, uh, um, very, very, very positive uh, uh, to, to, to transform the, 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 the political, uh, uh, you know, imaginary. And also I must say that, that I think that there is a critique which is sometimes made of, of, of this movement, which I think is unfair. And, and uh, it, they are saying, ah, oh, but they don't have any demand. Uh, 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 so, well, it depends. At first, I don't think it's, it's, it's true, because in fact, there, there is a demand. The, or, or to say Occupy Wall Street already indicate what they, what they don't want to see anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what they are not uh, uh, doing is, but I don't think that this should be their role, is making proposal about yeah, what things could be changed. Crap. Exactly, yeah. but that's not, that's not uh, what they should do. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, it's, they are putting things on the agenda and say, we don't want, this can't go on. Uh, uh, but they, they, they should not come and say this is what. So I, 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 I think that uh, 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 um, th th this seems to me really not, not a problem. The, the, the question, but, but it, it's, it's different. Also, because I've been, I've been speaking with, with different people and some, some very engaged and very, very thoughtful, I, I, I've thought, who are, for instance, uh, the, 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 asking a series of questions, for instance, the, what, uh, the creation of a chain of equivalent, and, and, and uh, um, it, it's, it's to, for me, one of the things which is very important in, in, in a movement like that is, is the, the way in which you can articulate different type of struggle, you know, and, and, and uh, um, this is where I think that the, the, some, some form of anarchism can, can we don't, do not want any form of organization of link can be, dang, be dangerous in order to, for, the, for the movement to, to maintain, you know, some kind of, of continuity. Uh, uh, but on the other side, I think that uh, uh, 
they are also people in the movement. Who are, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it well, they, they definitely have got an agonistic <laughs> yeah, <I need> that. <laughs> kind of discussion among them too. So uh, no, I, I, I think that uh, um, is something very, very, very important. But but I say, but in Greenhouse in Spain, it's really you know, something which I, 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 I don't think it is is very uh, uh, is something which is going to uh, you can't if. if uh, the, 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 this kind of vague thing about uh, uh, no form. Uh, and, and for instance, uh, the, to, to put into this the case of the uh, student movement in, in, in Chile, for instance, that's a completely different case. A student movement, they've got a leader, I mean, which is Camila Vallejo, which is a member of the Communist Party. Of course, no, she's, not, uh, she's still a leader. She's not been re-elected as that of, of the uh, President Union, but she's still basically the, the leader. So it is much more of a traditional, uh, uh, not even traditional in a negative sense at all, no? Uh, um, uh, 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 they also have got very clear demand. In that case, we want free education. We want a center. So you, we can't say that uh, this is the same kind of movement everywhere. And in fact, that, that again shows the importance of thinking in concrete, specific terms. You know, the, 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 the movement need, need to think of the, the situation in Chile is different from the situation here. And I think we need to, to it would be a mistake to try to say, OK, you know, there is the, the, the single movement, which is this is what all the, the people should do all over the world. I'd like to have your opinions about this question. Yes, so maybe it's time for questions to come from, from you. Is there a microphone there? Yes. Hi. Um, so there's, there's been a number of attempts in you know, the last quarter century, at least, to, to, uh, to introduce non-human actors as part of the discourse of radical democracy. Um, I think they've been mostly unsuccessful, and, and I think there's a number of reasons why. But in the context of, of the, the problemization of, of uh, identification and, or identity and, and consensus as a basis for radical democracy, um, does this, does, do, do your ideas in some way offer us a new way to sort of transform the introduction or, or the, the uh, deployment of, of the non-human um, uh, non-human um, and and I think that you know that's been tried in in the form of uh, you know personhood for whales uh, as well as sort of political ecology of things uh, a la Jane Bennett uh, for example but um, I'm, I'm, I'm just interested in in terms of where that fits in in terms of uh, an expanded um, expanded field of practice or an expanded field of subjectiviz subjectivization uh, for, yeah, radical democracy. Uh, I mean, I, I, are you basically uh, have in mind the work of Bruno Latour, for instance, or what? Sure. Uh, I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's yeah. A yeah, because uh, that that's the the the, the one I uh, um, well, I I I think that if 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 we are thinking of, of uh, um, well, I'm not. I would not really. Uh, uh, um, Pose the question in, t in terms of radical dem. Well, one could pose in question of radical in terms of, of radical democracy, of course. But, but here, I think that uh, more, I would prefer to at this moment to think in the question of creating agonistic public space, and this is certainly a terrain uh, which is important to to, to it's something that need to be brought into the the the, the accepted into the conversation of, 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 of the left. Uh, and I think more, more and more, no. I mean, it depends, of course, if you, uh, uh, it's a bit difficult to, to see. If, if, can, can, do you put, for instance, in the same category, the, 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 what will be the demand of the ecological movement? Because uh, uh, there is some affinities, but not m m many uh, 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 part, e ecologist party will not recognize themselves particularly in the approach of Bruno Latour, you know. Uh, uh, so um, I, um, oh, oh, but, but I, 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 I uh, the, the person which whose work I find also interesting from that point of view is Isabel Stengers. Uh, uh, and, and I like her, her idea of cosmopolitics, for instance, very much. 
because I am uh, personally critical of the cosmopolitanism, the traditional one, but uh, 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 the, the way in which he tried to redefine cosmopolitics, I found very interesting the, because it's, it's, it's not this kind of uh, rationalistic or humanistic, uh, but a la, a la, well, I don't want to put any name here, particularly some, for some people who are teaching at Harvard, but uh, uh, um, I, I, to, to, to think that we need to, to rethink the, the, the uh, politics at the, at the global level in terms of, of the cosmos. Yeah, I, 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 I find that uh, uh, really uh, interesting. And I find the, 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 the uh, um, proposal of uh, Bruno Latour for a parliament of things quite, there are also some, some interesting uh, things. Uh, um, where I, uh, uh, but, but I don't know, I, 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 Latour is a friend and I've known him for, uh, you know, quite a, uh, several years, but we, we, we've got a disagreement uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, a concern. I, I think that uh, he does not understand uh, 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 or, or not understand it, the, the question of hegemony. And, and, and in fact, constant, this is the point, you know, uh, when I speak of, of, of uh, hegemony, uh, Bruno said, but you know, I don't understand what is that? And I say, yes, Bruno, that is your problem. You don't understand the question of, he of hegemony. <laughs> so, I, I, uh, uh, but, but there are many, many elements in, in uh, let's say, we've got probably the, 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 the same uh, 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 theoretical adversaries, you know, uh, Abermas and some kind of, so they, they are uh, many, many point of uh, uh, convergence, uh, uh, but, and probably more uh, uh, from the point of view of politics, I think Stengers is, 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 is in fact more uh, aware of those issues than, 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 than Latour. Uh, um, I, so I, I think it's, it's definitely a, a, an important dimension to, to, to introduce in, into the, 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 the discussion. But, but I personally, for instance, have not uh, been, um, this is not the, not, not the field that I have, have uh, 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 well, I'm, I, I don't have the background in, in, in science that both Latour and Stengers have. So they are much more, uh, uh, bet, much better prepared you know, for, to develop that, but I, let's say that I'm sympathetic to, 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 to the kind of thing that they are saying, yes. And I think it definitely need to be an important element of, 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 of a radical democratic project, yeah. I can see how um, what you have called passions, affection, feelings, well, culture and hearts are crucial in the constitution of new sub subjectivities and eventually in uh, raising new demands. But I, I don't get how they can operate in the constitution of you have called the chain of equivalence. So which kind of artistic practice are you thinking that can help in this process? And what are you seeing around you Uh, well, uh, I think that the chain of equivalence is is, is something which uh, is more on the strict, uh, uh, not exclusively, but it's is because I can I can see also or, or some uh, 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 um, artistic practices could contribute to the the, the, the creation of a, a chain of equivalence. But but I think that 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 is something that is more located at the, uh, the you know, strictly political level. But where I think, that for, for me, uh, the, 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 it, it is at the level of the, the construction of subjectivity that, that uh, uh, artistic and cultural practices are important because our, our, our subjectivity, or what we, it is, or the, or we identify, this is done in, in very important part in through the the, 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 the the cultural level. And Gramsci from that point of view has been very, very important for me because he's been the one who has been showing oh uh, the common sense, the, the very idea that that that, that we have or the, the, the way if 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 you think that what what is stake in here is 
the, the, the idea that we uh, have of what, what is the world, what, what we just, this is through, uh, uh, through literature, to film, to artistic practices that, that we, uh, 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 we, we, we are not born with, with, with like, you know, some uh, 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 um, theorists will, will believe with already some, some idea. We, we are creating a subject within the context of a multiplicity of practices. Uh, uh, and, and of course, they are legal practices, they are, but uh, I, I, uh, I think I, I don't want you know, to, to put a percentage, but, but for me, uh, uh, more than 50% of those practices, I will uh, 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 you know, consider them as artistic and cultural practices, because this is how we begin to have an idea of, of who we are, what are the values, how to see the world. Uh, and this, of course, is a terrain which, which is uh, uh, the, the result of hegemonic construction. You know, it's not something which is there, given. It is always something which has been created in, 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 uh, before and which is reproduced. And, and this is something in which we can, we can in, in intervene uh, very much. So, uh, uh, oh, I mean, I don't know if that's what you asked me. There, there are many, many different... Uh, um, ways in which that can take place. And in fact, one of the points in which I've always insisted is that uh, it's, a, it's an error to believe that there is one form of, of artistic uh, practices which is the, the correct one for, for, for uh, uh, an, a radical project. For instance, I mean, uh, uh, um, I've, uh, I, one of my pet ideas in this area is to insist that um, contrary to what uh, uh, some people argue, beauty is not some, a, a concept of reaction. Here I'm, I'm referring to a debate that may, maybe you remember that, Christophe, yes. what could place in, 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 in France particularly, uh, uh, and Lyotard saying, ah, the, uh, 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 contemporary art can only deal with the sublime. You know, b b uh, the, the, the beauty is reactionary, it's bourgeois, it shouldn't be. Uh, I disagree with that. I, of course, I, 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 I think that it's wrong to say that the, the, the aim of art should be to, it could be related to beauty, of course. It, uh, but to say that beauty should be out of, no, beauty can be extremely subversive. I think that uh, if, if you think of the way in which tension can be produced, beauty can produce tension, can change. So, so beauty can be subversive. And, and it's a mistake to believe that, you know, the, the only way to make uh, 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 people aware of things is showing them all things are, 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 are horrible. Uh, 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 I, I think that you can move people very, very strongly through, through beauty. Uh, uh, in fact, for instance, to, to think of, of a, a, a project of of Christophe, I think the, the, the Hiroshima project, for instance, is a project which I think that the, those are, it's, it's very beautiful, but it's, it's, all, it's, it's, it's beautiful in, 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 in a very subversive way. Uh, uh, um, I, I think also, for instance, another example I will give of is, is uh, Alfredo Jarre, a project on, on uh, um, uh, Rwanda. I mean, there are some of the images, for instance, I, I'm thinking of the eyes of Gutete Merita, it's a very beautiful thing, but and it, it's of course something which is extreme. It, 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 com it managed to convey through uh, this beautiful image an incredible uh, 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 indictment of um, the, 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 the in, in, no, non. Uh, how can I the word the um, the, way, the, the way in which you know the West and and and, and people have, have not intervened. So they, in in Rwanda, the, the way that we've got really completely, we, we left this out in Africa. We don't want to do anything. So there, there are many different ways. Uh, uh, in, in, and, and this thing between beauty and, and uh, um, for instance, uh, uh, the, the sublime is, is is just one. And they, they, uh, on the other side, there are a few things which I, I personally uh, find not necessarily the the one which will contribute. L l uh, Basically, for, uh, uh, referring to that, my, my question is that are those practices contributing to some form of agonistic intervention or not? I mean, agonistic in the sense of asking questions, destabilizing, and 
I think that can be done in a different ways. On the other side, there are some practice which uh, uh, are presented as very, very radical. For instance, uh, I believe that uh, uh, people who would think that the most transgressive are is the most radical, I disagree with that. Because in fact, uh, 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 transgression, the neoliberalism love transgression. They thrive on trans transgression. You know, things which are transgressive or automatic, they love that. Uh, and of course, the, what happened is that this, this, those things which are meant to be extremely transgressive are very easily recuperated. And then, of course, those people say, you see, you know, it's absolutely impossible to, to, to really do something because even this is recuperated. But of course, this is precisely the kind of thing which is easily recuperated. Uh, even yes, men? Uh, but, but you think that uh, you think that there's transgression? I mean, what, 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 what you say? Even, what do you say? Even the yes man. I'm very, for, I'm very uh, uh, sympathetic like to yes the man, yes man. Yes, yes, I'm very yeah. sympathetic to the yes man. But but I would not say, say that as, okay. as that is not, not what, this is not what I think when I think yeah, of intervention. No, but for instance, uh, transgression, I'm thinking uh, uh, several years ago, it, 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 uh, 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 Chinese artist with, with what boiling children, if you heard about that, the, 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 this is an example, it's Yves Michaud gave me this, this, this example of, of uh, and they, uh, but apparently they, later there was some doubt if they had really boiling children, uh, really, uh, no, not children, uh, um, Fetuses, you know, no, no, <laughs> but, uh, and, and, but, but let's say, he meant to do something extremely transgressive, ah, yeah, yeah, you know, yes. you say? That's what uh, you mean. Okay. Yeah, exactly, that's what I mean, that bad transgression to mean, uh, uh, and that's sh so absolutely shocking that people, oh, you know, well, to break this kind of taboo, uh, uh, that's what I mean by transgression. No, no, I, 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 I never think of the, of the no, yes man as, as, as an example of transgression. No, I, I think, in fact, that what they do is really, uh, 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 very interesting. But here, for, for probably, I mean, for instance, you know, and Andy Bilsborn, who, by the way, is a friend of mine, uh, 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 in fact, I had many, many of the things I'm saying about uh, the Occupy movement come from discussion that I had with Andy in, uh, uh, um, in New York because he'd been very involved. But he does not really consider himself as, 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 as an artist, uh, uh, more as an activist. And I think here I, I want to say that um, it's important important in some cases to do the difference between um, what I will call artistic activism. And basically it's a form of activism which uh, makes use of aesthetic uh, 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 strategies, but whose aim is mainly uh, political. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and other uh, uh, art, uh, which are, are artists who want to be critical. And there is a tendency, which I also find co uh, problematic, to, for some people to believe that only artistic activism is today something which is, you know, critical. And be because, uh, uh, and every form of, of art uh, uh, that will take place in galleries or that will take place in the art world is can't be critical. That that's also something which I think is. Uh, 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 so we 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 need to 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 to. This thing, because well, yeah, wh one of the question, which is in fact, you know, come very much in relation to what I'm saying here, is uh, if, if we translate that in in the context of the uh, artistic, the art and negri position is that uh, uh, um, you should not never uh, work with a museum, with galleries, with th this is something it's total exodus from institution, including, of in course, artistic, artistic, artistic institution, university. you see? Uh, 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 while my strategy of engagement with, you no, know, you've got to engage with institution. With, well, I imagine that you, uh, in the field at, in which you are, you need to engage with institution, I suppose, no? Is we it, are. Uh, yeah, okay, so it's, it's not something that you can uh, even imagine uh, doing, your, uh, <laughs> doing your job uh, completely outside. But, but for many uh, 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 people in, in, in uh, um, some artistic and cultural practices, you know, there's the position, of, should we engage with the institution or should we not? And should we re receive money? I, I, I'm definitely for a if, if you've got the possibility to have an, uh, an, an, an exhibition somewhere. But use the terrain, use the terrain. Don't, don't have any, any problem with, with uh, uh, uh. so this is what the war of position means. You know, there are many places 
and you should occupy as many places as possible. Not to say, no, those are uh, uh, the place. No, 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 we, we can't be critical if we. But I, th I think it's important to, to work on the multiplicity of level. Th this is really. Uh, we have one room for one more question because of time limit. Hello. Uh, I wanted to ask you about a uh, uh, concern that I have uh, because I feel that one of the most important things in what you define as common sense or, or hegemonic construction at this point is uh, the fact that uh, creativity and everyday joy is extracted from everyday life, like uh, some kind of cultural construction by which uh, most of people uh, do not have creativity or do not have art, like if people were not hungry. Uh, and I think that that uh, kind of extraction of uh, this myth that regular people do not, uh, uh, do not have creative concerns is an essential aspect of the uh, machinery of consumism and uh, because after you uh, are deprived of your creativity and of your happiness in everyday life, uh, well, basically you uh, you have to consume in order to have, I don't know, joy or any sense of identification. So I, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, what your thoughts are about that. I'm not sure I've understood the question. Did you understand it? Uh, uh, um. <coughs> The beginning was not clear. The, yeah, the but question. What, what is exactly the the, the question? Uh, uh, the question. The question that I'm posing is this: I I have the notion yeah. that at this point is very important uh, for the cultural machine to extract uh, uh, the notion of creativity from most of people. Uh, Wait a second, but the, the, to extract um, uh, 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 to take away, let's say, uh, to, to create a, a, a cultural myth or or something that by which most of the people are not creative uh, well, and, theref no. and therefore the only way to express your difference or your uh, is through consumption so that that's what i wanted to ask no, you but about is that uh, 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 that your impression or did you do you have the impression at least uh, what i'm saying or what i mean no this is this is my impression your impression uh, um, well i mean Paolo Vino will disagree with that, and he will say, no, the problem is that uh, uh, all, all our capitalism, uh, 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 you know, um, is, is, is take, advan take advantage of, of our creativity that, that, that in order to, to produce, produce itself. Not, not that, uh, uh, um, hmm. I'm not, not quite sure uh, 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 how to address that because I, I think that, I mean, it's true that more and more in, in the, the post for this stage, I mean, the, 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 the for instance, the, 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 the way ad advertising works and th there is a, a blurring of the line uh, between art and advertising and, and, and that there are also uh, 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 many, uh, I, d I don't agree with all the, the interpretation of, of, of Virno, but the performance, but, but it's true. The, the production of symbol, it become uh, more uh, absolutely central in, 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 in the, the present form of capitalism. You know, it, 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 it is, uh, um, so for me, the problem is not so much that uh, people are deprived, I mean, uh, 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 in, the, in their creativity, in the sense that they they, they, they are impeded to, to that they, they, they are they, uh, because of, of, of the consumer culture they, they can cannot be creative uh, an, anymore. It's it, the the problem. It's, it's at least it's, as I see it, it's more that the appropriation by capitalism of deployment, the creative, deployment, deployment, yeah, of, yeah the, of, of creativity. The way this because creativity can can you can. No, it 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 seems your your view seems to be a bit pessimistic in the sense that we are all you know reduce consumer culture may make us all completely uh, uh, stupid or in, 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 incapable of, of creativity. No, I I think that there is a detournement of creativity. Creativity is is harness for for things which uh, contribute to the, the 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 development and the reproduction of capitalism. For me, this is the this is the problem. And, and, the problem and was our role in it, as artists and designers. What would be our role? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, uh, uh, I don't know, but but uh, uh, oh, uh, I imagine this that is I, not yeah, no, no, for but us yeah, exactly, answer, but, but no, but no, but I, I, I imagine, I imagine, look, look, I imagine that. Uh, 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 um, but they, 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 they are precisely, precisely because this dimension has become so important in, in culture today, your role has become also, your, your potential role has we, also become more important. Reappropriation. Re yes. Reappropriation yes, of that. Yes, yes, yes. You know, this, this, this terrain, is, it, in, in fact, it, it has. The terrain has been created for you to intervene into it. So, so to, but, but it is wh wh why, and this is where I think the question of war of position is important because they, 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 they are, of course, you know, trying to use your creativity uh, 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 in a way, but, but there is always the, the possibility to, to, to fight, fight back. So for instance, we need uh, both passion and intelligence here. Well, of course, I mean. Uh, 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 <laughs> No, just to finish that on another example of 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 of, of this, for instance, it's a prob I'm sure you 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 know this uh, because it, it it took place here in 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 the U.S. But for me, it's a really interesting example of what I I I, I see the little war of guerrilla that we can have with capitalism. You remember the Grand Fury Collective, the moment in which uh, uh, that was in the moment when the, the old days that they, 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 they did this, they reappropriated a kind of Benetton mm -hmm. uh, uh, side. Because Benetton, I mean, Benetton, that, 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 that's very interesting, the movement, because, of course, Benetton of advertising, they appropriate artistic strategies in order to... to, to and even to, critical. To, yeah, exactly, exactly, in order to sell their product, you know? And then they say, oh, well, you see. But then the Grand Fury Collective, Redetourn uh, 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 their, their thing about, uh, about kissing does not kill. They, you, you had uh, several uh, couples. Uh, uh, there the was, if I remember, uh, uh, normal heterosexual. Then was a lesbian. Then there was an, uh, again there was a, a, a mixture, mixed couple also, uh, uh, like a, a Benetton advert mm -hmm. uh, on, on the buses but with a political message. I, th I think that's a great idea because it, 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 they uh, use you and, and, and you, you uh, uh, fight back by, by you know, make it, making, uh, uh, that's, that's exactly the tournament huh, in, in this case. Oh, Chantal, in this proactive, positive tone, yeah, yeah, we, <laughs> we should end our session. Thank you very much, Chantal. <laughs>